Right, so I know a lot of you are going to be thinking, who is this guy? This isn't Jordan Peterson, but let me just quickly explain. In this video, we're going to be breaking down what Jordan Peterson has to say about the philosophy of Stoicism. And I've done a lot of research, and I'm going to be taking clips of what he says, then I'm going to be giving my response to what he has to say, and I'm a YouTuber who has made over 300 videos about the philosophy of Stoicism, and we're just going to be discussing his opinions on that. Now, I want this to be an open discussion, so feel free at any point during this video to comment down below what you think about this discussion, and if you've got anything you have to say, then just leave it down in the comments. So I'm just jumping in to edit this video and I wanted to leave you a quick two second message. And that message is that some of the clips in this video are up to six minutes long. And I know nowadays our attention spans are very, very limited. But instead of when you get that urge for some dopamine or some urge for some stimulation, instead of clicking off, why not practice your focus and see if you can watch this video right until the end? Because I know you're going to get some amazing benefits if you can focus by mixing Jordan Peterson and the philosophy of Stoicism's ideas together. Enjoy. Okay, so the question is, can that sense of meaning be hijacked? And the answer to that is absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because you could say that the ultimate sense of meaning is composed of the union of fragmentary senses of meaning and the fragmentary senses of meaning can be overwhelmingly powerful anger sexual lust and 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 the sorts of things that you experience when say when you're playing a video game which are very carefully calibrated to keep you on the on the edge of exploration let's say now i'm not a, a foe of video games because games are complicated and it isn't clear what people are doing when they're playing them you know, they may be expanding their cognitive skills, they may be learning to cooperate, they may be learning to engage in complex problem solving. And so, but part of it's also a matter of balance, you know, 50 hours a week, probably not, unless you're going to go pro, right? Because there's other things you need to be attending to, it's not a stable solution for you, your family, your society, it's too one-sided, yeah, and you can get pulled down rabbit holes of all sorts that, that are one-sided pursuits of meaning. So, and it's some, something we're actually going to talk about as the later classes unfold. The question is, how do you stop yourself from falling prey to a pathologized sense of meaning? And I think one of the answers to that is, don't lie. Because what you're hoping is that your nervous system is sufficiently healthy and well-programmed so that what it reads out to you is reliable. And if you pathologize your psyche by either through sins of omission, let's say, or, or outright deception, you're going to warp that internal structure and it's not going to read out properly to you. And then your sense of meaning will lead you astray. So like one of the reasons for speaking the truth, I shouldn't say that because you don't know how to speak the truth, but you do know how not to lie. And it's a game you're playing with yourself. You can define the damn lies. No one else has to do that for you. you, you you try not to utter falsehoods, because you warp your neurological structure by doing so, and then it will read out pathologically, and then if you rely on it to guide you, it will run you right off a cliff. So that's why there's a moral element to this, is if you're going to rely on your sense of meaning, make sure that you don't pollute the mechanism. See, this is, this is partly why people go to confession. Right, which is, my, which is a, like a psychotherapeutic technique. It's like, okay, what stupid, miserable, wretched things did I do this week? Well, that's a good thing to, to make conscious, right? Because maybe you cannot do them the next week. And you think, well, why would you bother? It's like, well, you're in a ship. It's sailing across the, the, the stormy seas. If, if, you're, if you're hacking holes in it with a pickaxe, you should probably pay attention to that before you sink. So, it's a good idea to keep, to keep what you're doing that's stupid in mind, so that you can stop doing it. And so then you can more and more rely on yourself and your, and your own, you know, your own conscience, let's say, as a guide to proper action. You know in the Pinocchio story is that the conscience was not an unerring guide for Pinocchio. It had to learn. And so, and so it's also partly pushing yourself into new situations and differentiating yourself so that you get wiser and and so it's courage as well as truth those those might be the two there's more beauty courage truth you know the fundamental virtues yeah. why be virtuous that's the question it's so that you can bear the suffering of life without becoming corrupt right it's practical it's practical there's nothing more practical than that 
So, unless you want misery, and people do, you know, it's exciting, misery. So, so the main thing I want to note about what Jordan Peterson has just said and his, uh, his reasoning as to why virtue is important is that most people, they think virtue is just airy-fairy. You should do the right thing, but we never get told why. As I was growing up, of course, I was informed that we shouldn't lie. We shouldn't in insult other people. We shouldn't hurt other people. But never once was I explained the reason why. And this led maybe three or four years ago, I didn't care about any of those things. I didn't care about lying. If I could benefit from the lie, of course I was going to do it because I didn't understand why you shouldn't lie. I thought it was some airy-fairy hippie concept. I didn't understand the true implications of lying. But now I fully recognize that being virtuous is a completely practical, logical thing to do. Because when you lie to people, you're damaging your psyche, you're damaging your ability to reason. And this is something that most people don't even realize. They don't understand why you should be virtuous for the practical reason. Because not only will it benefit you, but it's, of course it's gonna benefit the people around you. We know that. But when it comes to recognizing that it will benefit you, living a virtuous life will, and in and of itself, be a benefit to you. It will make you happier, and it will increase your ability to reason then it makes it so clear and so much more compelling of a reason why you should be virtuous. Well, there isn't any difference between the fool and someone who's courageous, right, from an archetypal perspective. And, I mean, Abraham is a fool, obviously, when he starts his, his, his adventures. I mean, the story lays it out in that manner. He's far too old to be leaving home, for example. He's a late bloomer. You know, and, and then he has, he has a lot of catastrophic adventures along the way. And certainly you could imagine that had you encountered him when he first encountered the famine in the land of strangers when he first went out, that the idea that he had, uh, he had followed his misguided intuitions would have been self-evident. But in the Abrahamic stories, there is this call to get out and do. And, and that's it. And the thing is, is that, you know, one of the things I've learned to put it, to make it concretely is that, like, I've done a lot of different things in my life. And every time I did a new thing, I was a fool. I did it badly. I, I was an imposter, right? And, and, and because uh, when you first start to do something, you don't know what you're doing. But that, that's okay. That's an acceptance of your vulnerability, right? And your ignorance. That's humility in some sense. The willingness to be a fool in, a new, in the land of strangers. That's it. The willingness to be a fool in the land of strangers. And that's an act of courage. Because you also reveal your vulnerability to the world by stumbling around. But as long as you're stumbling forward, then you're going to move forward. Now, how do you do that more concretely? You aim at an ideal, right? And you aim at an ideal that's beyond you. Now, maybe you don't aim to begin with at an idea that ideal that's so beyond you that you're crushed by its magnificence, you know? Maybe that's... that's that's too demotivating to move you. But you could at least conceptualize yourself as the you that you are with fewer of the faults that you know of. And that's a good start. And I also think that's associated with the idea of humility. Take stock. Figure out how it is that you're not who you could be. And then move in that direction. And accept the consequences. You know, you're, you're going to get slapped a lot. But maybe with each slap, you'll straighten up a little bit. Especially if you listen, even to the people who are slapping you. Because sometimes they're the ones who can reveal for you very quickly where it is that you're weak and insufficient so that you won't have to be that way in the future. So, yeah. Now, if this clip isn't a stoic concept, then I don't know what is. What he's talking about here is using adversity to in increase your skills and increase your mental fortitude. He's saying that no matter what happens to you, you should always be pushing the boundary and be using that boundary pushing as a tool for increasing your mental fortitude. Because when you can constantly get outside of your comfort zone, you're gonna be improving yourself. So by forcing yourself to get outside of your comfort zone, you're making yourself tougher and you're making yourself more aligned with how the world actually works. Now a great tool that I found to do this is one that you can do, it's just a simple exercise. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is leave links down in the description for the free worksheets that you can get. And what that's gonna tell you is exactly who you are right now, and exactly who you need to be to easily achieve your goals. And once you know exactly who you are now and exactly who you need to be in order to achieve your goals, then self-development becomes simple. You just take the steps to go from where you are now to where you need to be to achieve your goals. So there's a link down in the description for that free worksheets that you can do right now.
If you're enjoying this video so far, I'd really appreciate it if you could like the video by clicking the like button. Go down and just let me know whatever you have to say in the comment section. And if you want to see more videos like this one, then subscribe. By doing those things, first of all, I'll greatly appreciate it. And second of all, more people will get to see this video and benefit, hopefully, from this video. Thank you. Is remove the toxic people in your life wholly good advice? Well, no, I wouldn't say it's wholly good advice because no single piece of advice could be considered as wholly good, except perhaps for tell the truth. I think that one might be outside that, um, that rule of thumb. It depends very much on what you mean by toxic and also who's doing the judgment with regards to toxicity. My sense is, is that you should surround yourself with people who genuinely want the best for you, or perhaps more specifically, genuinely want the best for the best part of you. And if you're, if the people around you are not supporting you in your endeavors, and they put you down, and they punish you for your virtues, or even punish you too intensely for your faults, and fail to reward you when you're doing what you should be doing, and fail to engage in reciprocal interactions, that there comes a point where you would be better off finding someone who is actually on your side. And that can even be the case with family members, although, of course, that's a very difficult decision to make. But sometimes people do have the misfortune of being tangled up with family members who are so, who are operating in a manner that's so counterproductive to their health that it's better for them, despite the pain, to cease communication with them. And, and sometimes paradoxically enough, that can also facilitate communication because sometimes you have to draw a line in the sand before people are willing to undergo the serious self-consideration that pr would precede any real transformation. So, but I would say, even if, even if you don't like the idea of removing the toxic people in your life, you should certainly endeavor to surround yourself with the sorts of people that you would want to surround someone that you regarded as your friend or loved one. So you need, to, you need to extend the same courtesy to yourself, especially to the part of yourself that's striving upward, that you would to someone that you cared for. So, so for this one, I just want to leave you with a couple quotes from the ancient Stoic philosophers. And the first one is from Marcus Aurelius, and it goes like this. There's nothing worse than a wolf befriending sheep. Avoid false friendships at all costs. If you are good, straightforward, and well-meaning, it should show in your eyes and not escape notice. Now on the other side, Seneca has to say this. Nothing, however, delights the mind as much as loving and loyal friendship. So Stoicism is just putting an emphasis on making sure that you surround yourself with the right kind of people. And this is something that Jordan Peterson clearly agrees with. The internal problem is, how do you deal with tragedy and malevolence? And you can say, well, I'm not prepared. It's like, yeah, fair enough unsurprising, especially if you were overprotected as a child. It's not a good idea to overprotect your kids, because the snakes are going to come into the garden, no matter what you do. And so then you, instead of trying to keep the damn snakes away, what you do is you arm your child with something that can help them chop them into pieces, and make the world out of them. So that the, the trick for human thriving in the face of suffering and malevolence is strength, not protection. It's a completely different idea. We also know this clinically. We know, for example, that if you treat people with exposure therapy for agoraphobia, which is, roughly speaking, the fear of chaos, I would say, the fear of everything, you don't make them less afraid. You make them braver. It's not the same thing. Because with an agoraphobic, see, what happens to them is, is the fall. They never conceptualize death and suffering. They're naive, right? It, it never enters their, the theater of their imagination, and it's because they're protected from it. But then something happens, this, this often happens to women in their 40s, because they're, they're the people most likely to develop agoraphobia. Something happens, they're, they've been protected from chaos by authority their entire life. So maybe they had an overprotective father, and then they went to an overprotective boyfriend, and then they went to an overprotective husband. And maybe they were willing to be subjugated to all three of those because of the prote protection, right? So, so that's the bargain. They, they stay weak and dependent. And maybe they have to, because that's the only way they can appeal to the person who's hyper-protective. But the price they pay for that is that they're not sufficiently competent. And then something happens in their life, often in their 40s, they develop heart palpitations, maybe as a consequence of menopause. Their heart starts to 
beat erratically and they think, oh no, death. It's like, well, who are you going to talk to about that? Right? There's no protection from authority for that. Or maybe their friend gets divorced, or maybe their sister dies, or something like that. It brings up the specter of mortality, and maybe the specter of malevolence and mortality. And it brings it up in a way that authority, recourse to authority, cannot solve. And so then they have panic attacks. What happens? They go out, they get afraid, they feel their heart beating. Then they get afraid of their heart beating because they think, oh no, I'm going to die. And they think, oh no, I'm going to die, and I'm going to make a fool of myself while I'm doing it and attract a lot of attention. So the two big fears come up. Mortality and social judgment. And then they have a panic attack. It's like fight or flight's gone out of control. Very, very unpleasant. Then they start to avoid the places they've had a panic attack. Then they end up not being able to go anywhere. So then Tiamat has come back, right? A huge monster, a little victim. And so what do you do with them? Well, you, there's no saying, no, there's no Tiamat. That's done, right? Their naivety is over. They've had a direct contact with the threat of mortality and social judgment. They've met the terrible mother, and they've met the terrible father. And there's no going back. There's no saying, oh, the world is safe. It's not safe. Not at all. It's not safe. The fact that you think it's safe means that you were living in an unconscious bubble that was sort of provided to you by your culture. It's a gift. And now that's been shattered. And so now what do you do? Well, the answer is you retreat until you're in your house and there's nowhere you can go. You're the ultimate frozen rabbit, right? And your life is hell because you can't function. The alternative is, let's take apart the things you're afraid of. Let's expose you to them, you know, carefully and programmatically. And then you'll learn that you can, you're actually tougher than you think. You never knew that. And maybe you didn't want to take on the responsibility, because, you know, people play a role in their own demise, so to speak. When you had opportunity to go out and explore, or withdraw because you were afraid, you chose to withdraw because you were afraid. So it's not only that you were overprotected often, it's that you were willing to take advantage of the pr fact that you were overprotected, and run back there whenever you had the opportunity. You know, so maybe you're a kid in the playground, right, and you're having some trouble with other kids, and you know in the back of your mind, I should deal, this with, deal with this myself, but you go and tell your mom and get her to intervene. And you know that that's not right. You know that you're breaking the social contract, but it's easier, and so that's what you do. You run off to an authority figure and hide behind the great father, right, roughly speaking. Well, the problem with that is you don't learn how to do it yourself. So then you have to relearn it painfully when you're 40. So then you take people out, you say, well, what are you afraid of? Rank it from one to ten. So ten is, we'll make a list of ten things you're afraid of. The least, the thing you're least afraid of, we'll call number ten. So we'll start with that. Okay, well, I'm afraid of elevators. Okay, well, let's, let's look at a picture of an elevator. Let's have you imagine being in an elevator. Let's go out to an elevator and let you watch the terrible jaws of death open, because that's how you're responding to it, symbolically. Right, and you're going to do that at it at the, the closest proximity you can manage. You find out you go do that, it works. You're nervous as hell, especially an, from an anticipatory perspective. Shaking. You go out, you stop, you watch it happen, and you actually calm down. You do that ten times and it no longer bothers you. Well, what you've learned that you didn't die. But more importantly than that, you've learned that you could withstand the threat of death. That's what you've learned. And then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and then you move a little closer, and finally you're back in what's no longer the elevator from a symbolic perspective. It's a tomb, right? It's, it's, it's a place of enclosure and isolation. And you learn, hmm, turns out I can withstand that. And then you're met much more together, much more confident. And that's often one of the things that often happens in situations like that. I've seen this multiple times is that if you run someone through an exposure training process like that and, and toughen them up, they'll often start standing up to people around them in a way they never did before because they wouldn't stand up for themselves before because they weren't willing to undermine the protection. See, if you're protecting me, I can't bother you because I can't afford to forsake your protection. So if I'm going to play that game, I'm going to be hi hide behind you, then I can't challenge you. So that's no good, because that's sometimes why people, you see this with guys very frequently, they're still deathly afraid of their father's judgment when they're in their 30s or 40s. It's like, well, why? Because well, they still want to believe that there's someone out there that knows. 
and so they're willing to accept the subjugation because it doesn't force them to challenge the idea that there's someone out there that knows because that's the advantage of having your father as a judge right? because he knows well what if he doesn't? what if no one knows any better than you? well that's a rough thing, you don't until you realize that you're not an adult right? that's really technically the point of realization of adulthood is that no one actually knows what you should do more than you do I mean it's a horrible realization because what the hell do you know? It's a terrible realization, and people will often pick slavery, permanent slavery, to the spirit of the Great Father, let's say, over that realization, and it's completely understandable. But the problem with it is, is that there's more to you than you think, and so if you continue to hide behind that figure, then you never have a chance to understand that there's more to you than you think, far more to you than you think. Maybe there's enough to you so that you can actually withstand the threat of mortality without collapsing, maybe even withstand the threat of malevolence without collapsing who knows, it's certainly possible and it's not an abstract question, it's exactly the sort of question that you address in the psychotherapeutic process it's, it's always the question that you address and the answer is often in the affirmative because people can get unbelievably tough and you know that, because people work in emergency wards and hospitals, right, or they work in in uh, palliative care wards, or they work as mortuary assistants. I mean, these people have bloody rough jobs, you know, or they're on the front line of police investigation into, you know, heinous child abuse crimes, and so they're confronting malevolence on a regular basis. And you know, those are very stressful jobs, but people do them, and and some people do them without even being damaged by them. Although that's a harder thing because you can see horrible things, you know, things you'll never forget. Summarized in one sentence, don't run away from fear, get braver. And Stoicism actually has a tool for letting you get braver. You see, there's a, a story of a wild boar was sharpening his tusks against a tree. And it was completely calm, just a normal day in the woods. And the rabbit walked up to him and said, why are you sharpening your tusks? There's no danger around. There is no need for you to sharpen your tusks. The wild boar replied, I must get myself ready for fortitude when times are at peace. Put simply, he must prepare himself when times are going to get difficult in the future by preparing himself when times are calm. Now Stoicism calls this voluntary discomfort and what this means is voluntarily putting yourself outside of your comfort zone so that you get used to being outside of your comfort zone. For when you need to get outside of your comfort zone, it will be easy for you to get outside of your comfort zone. Now, let me read you a quote from Seneca and he says, Here's a lesson to test your mind's mettle. Take parts of a week in which you have only the most meager and cheap food. Dress scantily in shabby clothes and ask yourself if this is really the worst that you feared. It is when times are good that you should gird yourself for tougher times ahead. For when fortune is kind, the soul can build defenses against her ravages. So it is that shoulders practices, so it is that soldiers practice maneuvers in peacetime erecting bunkers with no enemies in sight and exhausting themselves under no attack so that when it comes they won't grow tired. Amy Pellegrini says, why is self-sabotage such a feature in human life? Why is self-sabotage such a feature? Okay, here's a couple of reasons. The first is, is that there's a lot of responsibility with success, right? So if you if you say yes to things and you do a good job and and you bear a large burden and you have to carry it and a lot of that might be success but you know failure is a lot easier than success plus you can complain about it and whine about it and be a victim and you know garner all sorts of kudos from yourself and others that way so there's that it's just failure to adopt responsibility but then I would say too there's also revenge on on the self and God that's partly why I like the Cain and Abel story so much once I sort of figured out what it meant um, People have a hard time not having the kind of contempt that borders on self-hatred for themselves, partly because, you know, we are fragile and mortal creatures and prone to error and malevolence, and we know that of ourselves better than anyone else. And because we know that, we're prone to punish ourselves and, and to think ill of ourselves. And, you know, one of the things I learned from Jung was that the injunction to do unto your neighbor as you would have him do unto you was an equation rather than um, a statement about how to be nice to people 
and that you have an ethical obligation to treat yourself as if you're some a person of value even if you don't really feel that that you owe yourself the that you owe yourself the same treatment that you would give someone that you cared for and loved. And that's a really hard thing to learn, you know, because you kind of have to detach yourself from your knowledge of all your insufficiencies and your flaws and treat yourself with dignity and respect, at least the dignity and respect due someone who's faulty that could conceivably learn. And that's a very difficult ethical lesson to learn. It's, it's easier to beat yourself continually on the head, back of the head with a club and to feel it's justified given how much you know about how wretched and useless you are. So, so let's say there's two reasons. Um, one is that you don't want the responsibility, so it's not really self-sabotage. It's just avoidance of responsibility and consequent failure. And the second is punishment, self-punishment that seems only just given what you know about all your pathology and, and, and error and and insufficiencies so i would say that's that's the big two there <clears throat> there's a stoic quote that goes along the lines of stop talking about what a good man should be and start being one and what jordan peterson here is talking about is so important because if you can start treating yourself with the respect that you deserve then most of your problems will start to vanish why would you be putting all of this unhealthy food inside of your body if you truly respected yourself why would you not be exercising if you truly respected yourself? Why would you be lying to others if you truly respected yourself? Why would you be wasting your time if you truly respected yourself? And by building that respect for yourself, the things that you're going to start doing for yourself will start to happen naturally. So if you can start respecting yourself, then the actions you need to take to reinforce that self-respect will start happening. But it all starts with just saying to yourself, I'm going to treat myself like I would treat a dear friend that I want the best for. Because there's a quote, or a statistic I should say, that in America, people are more likely to finish their prescriptions for their dogs than they are to finish their prescriptions for themselves. Meaning that the vet gives them medicine, they're going to give it all to their dog. But if the doctor gives them medicine, they're not very likely to eat it through, or, or eat it, <laughs> you know, consume the medicine. Start respecting yourself and the actions will start to follow. And that all starts by just making a decision that I'm going to treat myself with as much respect as I can master. Let's say you're socially anxious. Okay, so what happens when you're socially anxious? You go to a party, your heart's beating. Why? The party is a monster. Why? Because it's judging you. And it's judging you, it's putting you low down the dominance hierarchy. Because that's what a negative judgment is. And that interferes with your sexual success and that means that you're being harshly evaluated by nature itself right so you are confronting the, the dragon of chaos when you go into the social situation and so what do you do you're like this right you hunch over and that's low dominance I'm no threat it's like well that's not going to get you very far you know but that's a logical thing to do in, in the in, in the face of a tyrant so I'm no threat you know you look at the king and you're dead I'm no threat I'm hunched over and then what's happening internally? How are, what are people thinking about me? What are people thinking about me? Am, am I looking stupid? Am I looking foolish? Geez, I'm awkward. I hate being here. Man, I'm sweating too much. It's all internalized, right? It's all self-focused. The, the, the I isn't work. The I isn't working. What do you tell people? Stop. Don't stop thinking about yourself. Because you can't. It's like, don't think of a white elephant. White elephant, white elephant, white elephant. You can't tell someone to stop thinking about something because they get caught in a loop. What you do with socially anxious people is you say, look at other people. Look at them, right? Why? Because if you look at them, you can tell what they're thinking. And then you, you're, unless, you're, unless you're terribly socialized, and some people are, some people have no social skills. And so the reason they can't go to a party is because they don't even know how to introduce themselves. Like they're just, no one ever taught them how to behave. And so they're really good candidates for behavior therapy. Because you walk them through the process of how you actually manifest the procedures that are associated with social acceptability. But most people aren't like that. They have the ability. So if they're really introverted and high in neuroticism, they can usually talk quite well to someone one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Because they look at them. Well, if I look at you, it's another thing to do if you're ever speaking to a group of people. Never speak to the group of people. That doesn't exist. You talk to 
individuals and then they reflect for you the entire group because they're all entrained so you look at one person they broadcast to you what everyone's thinking and you know how to talk to one person so it's easy so as soon as you focus on the person, not you you push your attention outward, you use your eye, you push your attention outward and you start watching, well then all your automatic mechanisms kick in and you stop being awkward, because if we're talking and I'm looking here I don't know what you're going to do next and I'm going to put disjunctions into the, like, they're like uh, bad chords in the melody of our, of our conversation and the reason is I'm not paying attention so that's why the eye is the thing at the top of the pyramid it's like the thing that enables you to win the set of all possible dominance hierarchies is the eye pay attention pay attention that's the critical issue that's why the Egyptians worshipped Horus that's why Horus was the thing that rescued Osiris from the from the depths it's the capacity to pay attention what do you pay attention to most? what your right hemisphere signals as anomalous it, it, it attracts your attention it's like this isn't going quite right I'm not looking at that WRONG that's what you look at that's what you look at what's not going right because that's see that's the terrible monster that might eat you but it's also the place you get all the information so that's why it's useful to have discussions with your enemies because they will tell you things you do not know and that's such a great thing because if you don't know them well you're not very smart are you? you know there may be a time when you go somewhere that that's the thing you need to know and maybe your enemy will tell you why you're such a fool you know, and a bunch of other things that aren't true too but even one thing that's accurate, it's like, yeah, thanks very much, man, maybe I'll do some work on that and I won't have to carry that forward so, and then that's part of the reason again why the terrible predator it's always the terrible predator that has the gold it's like, it's the person who delivers the message you do not want to hear so it's rough, it's rough but it doesn't matter, life is rough Apart from the fact that I agree with everything he's saying, there's just one thing that I want to pick out, and that's his reference to behavioural therapy. And if you didn't know, cognitive behavioural therapy is the most popular, popular therapeutic technique that's being used nowadays by pretty much every single therapist out there. And it's based on the philosophy of Stoicism. Literally, if you read up about cognitive behavioural therapy, and the book Feeling Good by David Burns is a great place to start if you're feeling depressed or anxious or social anxiety, but cognitive behavioural therapy, and if you read through it, you'll recognise that literally all it is saying is the philosophy of Stoicism, which is great because cognitive behavioural therapy has been tested by science, and it is actually far more effective at curing depression than depression pills. No matter what the depression pill is, it doesn't beat the effectiveness of cognitive behavioural therapy. And just knowing that that is completely based on Stoicism is incredible, because we now know that the philosophy of Stoicism and everything that it recommends has been scientifically proven to work at increasing your mood and increasing your mental fortitude. So, do you have any practical advice on how I can improve my ability to concentrate and pay attention to the world around me? Um, well, I have some practical advice for that. The first piece of practical advice, often the devil's in the details, you know, but often the, some practical advice is, well, regulate your, regulate your habits. Um, try to get up at approximately the same time each morning. I would recommend that you get up approximately when other people get up. So that would be something in the neighborhood of 7.30 or 8 in the morning. Or perhaps earlier, perhaps a little bit later. But you want to stabilize that because your, your circadian rhythms operate more, uh, what would you call it, fluidly. And your mood is likely to be regulated better if there's islands of stability in your daily routines. Human beings like daily routines, just like dogs like daily routines. And so, regulate your sleep. Um, I would say, when you get up in the morning, eat breakfast. That's a really important thing to do. I can't tell you how many people I've treated in my clinical practice whose proclivity for emotional instability and depression, anxiety, general hopelessness, um, emotional pain and gloom and doom, as well as capacity to concentrate, were properly regulated or inhibited or reduced by merely ensuring that they ate a, I would say, a protein and fat rich breakfast relatively soon after they wake up. And that's especially true if they're stressed. And as it turns out that if you stress yourself after a fast, which is of course what you've undertaken if you haven't eaten since the night before, 
that your body produces enough insulin to deplete your 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 to deplete the sugar in your blood and then it's very difficult for you to become regulated properly with regards to your metabolism until you sleep again and so it can be regulating your sleep and your breakfast eating habits in particular can be in a very effective way of regulating your mood and increasing your capacity to concentrate the other thing i would say is that spending some time scheduling your time is also extraordinarily useful and so i can tell you a little bit how about how to use schedules effectively so the first thing i would do is, is or the first thing i would say is that you should um you should you should develop a long-term plan you can use something like the future authoring program which most of you are familiar with because of course you would have got a key to it uh, almost everyone as a consequence of being a patron is you have to you have to set up your vision like Geppetto when he's looking at the star before Pinocchio's transformation takes place you have to set up your long-term vision to have some vision of the good towards which you're working and some vision perhaps of the hell that you're avoiding and then I would say once you set up that vision so that you know how to orient yourself then you should start designing your days and you can do that very effectively with a calendar like Google Calendar and instead of many people say well I, I hate using a schedule and or I hate using a calendar and what I would say about that is is that if you hate using a schedule or a calendar then you're probably using it wrong what you're doing is using the calendar as a, an external tyrant that's telling you what you should do if you were going to be a conventionally good person each day so you load yourself up with with arbitrary we'll say arbitrary responsibilities but that's not really how you should use a schedule what you should use a schedule to do is to design the day that you would most like to have and obviously that's going to include accepting some responsibility and undertaking to make progress on those things that you have to make progress on to keep your life from collapsing into chaos but it should also mean that you schedule in activities that make you actually want to have that day and so if you're using a schedule properly that it can be your friend and that can also be something that can increase your capacity to concentrate and then I would say well if you're if you're very scattered then you can start to train yourself you might say well um, I need to learn to read without distraction so maybe what you do you say okay well for the next week I'm going to read 10 minutes a day and I'm going to try to limit the distractions and if you're successful at that then you could try 12 minutes a day and if you're successful at that you could try 15 minutes a day and the trick is to set a goal for yourself that is slightly beyond your current level of performance enough to be challenging enough to be worthwhile if you accomplished but not so difficult that you're likely to fail and then practice incrementally day by day trying to inculcate the habits that you want to inculcate and assume that it'll take you a number of months or even a number of years in order to become very fluent at the habit the, the important thing is to start improving incrementally because incremental improvement pays off like uh, compound interest and so I would also say that the trajectory that you're on is more important than your starting point and, and that's also an extraordinarily optimistic observation because it means that direction is more important than current position and, and I mean current position matters obviously but it I don't think it does matter as much as direction so if you want to learn to concentrate more define what constitutes concentration break it into micro habits and then start practicing instantiation of those micro habits so very good advice here Robbie Kelly says how do you eat an elephant you bite off one chunk at a time well that's exactly right and that's also the the hallmark of behavior therapy the the issue so what a behavior therapist does and, and I'm an admirer of behavior therapy although uh, there's other psychotherapeutic approaches that I also appreciate to to a great degree uh, for for more that are in some sense more conceptually sophisticated but one of the things you do if you're a behavior therapist is take the problem at hand and decompose it into its micro elements and then practice implementation of the micro elements and that can be the inculcation of new habits as I already mentioned but that's also a great way of learning to face the things that you're avoiding learning to confront the things you're avoiding that that frighten you or that stop you in your tracks so 
you know, if, you, if you're if you scared of going to parties or maybe scared of going out in public, you can also always go to the nearest bar for 10 minutes and sit there and, and have a drink and then leave, you know, and then maybe expand that up to 12 minutes and then maybe dare at one of the, dare at one point when you go out to say hi to someone. But again, don't ever underestimate the utility of incremental improvement. You can get a tremendous distance by, by uh, engaging in incremental imp improvement. All right, so there's quite a lot in this clip that I want to say. Quite a lot relates to me and quite a lot relates to the philosophy of Stoicism. The first one, when he talks about habit, let me read you a quote uh, from Seneca. Every habit and capability is confirmed and grows in its corresponding actions, walking by walking, running by running. Therefore, if you want to do something, make a habit of it. And habits are so important. And in fact, all of the Stoic philosophers had their own habits and rituals. Every single one of them uh, had a journaling routine. Some of them did it in the morning and some of them did it in the evening. Either way, they had that set routine. And if you implement a set routine in your life, your life's gonna have structure, you're gonna have to make less decisions and you're just gonna be able to get on with what you need to do every single day. The next thing he talked about was vision, having a core vision that's out there. This is so important that I've actually made a course on it because if without a vision, without a clear idea of where you need to go, then you don't know what you need to do to get to where you want to go. You must have a vision that is so clear that you can close your eyes and feel that you're in that vision. You must be able to picture it and feel it so clearly. And that only comes by taking the time to focus on your, uh, your vision day in and day out. Maybe it's in your journal, maybe it's in your growth journal, whatever the case may be, you must have a clear vision that will drag you forwards and will let you know exactly what you need to do in order to progress your life forwards. The next thing we talked about was focus. Having that clear focus on what you need to do is just as important as having a clear vision because we live in a world of distractions. We live in a world where everything is fighting for our attention. Instead, when you work, turn off your phone, put it in your bag, put it away, that is the easiest way to focus. Remove distractions, set up your environment to remove distractions. Maybe that's removing the little bookmarks on the top of your Chrome browser. Maybe that's removing push notifications to your laptop. Whatever the case may be, redesign your environment to focus as much as you can. Because if you go into any coffee shop, you'll see that everyone is distracted. You will get ahead of all of your competitors if you can change your environment in a way and put a lot of effort on focusing your environment in a way that's going to encourage you to focus. Next thing he talks about was doing things bit by bit by bit. Now, when you exercise and when you go to the gym, there's this concept called progressive overload. And what that means is every single time you go to the gym, you add a little bit more weight on or you do a little bit more reps or you uh, decrease the rest time between the reps. Basically, you make it a little bit harder every single time you go. And the key word here is a little bit harder. Because if you're just starting on this self-development journey and you say to yourself, right, I'm gonna work 15 hours a day and I'm gonna meditate and I'm gonna exercise for two hours today, that's not going to work. You need to slowly and gradually increase yourself little bit by little bit because there's no point trying to meditate for an hour a day if you've never meditated before. You're gonna do it for two days, then you're gonna fall out. Instead, recognize the importance of habits and start meditating just two minutes a day. Then when that becomes easy, you increase it to five minutes a day. And the final thing he talked about was trajectory. And this is something that I've talked about multiple times before. It doesn't matter if you're all the way up here in whatever the scale may be. Maybe it's happiness, maybe it's energy. And it doesn't matter if you're down here. What matters is your trajectory. Because if you're up here and you're on a downward trajectory, with time, the person that's down here is going to beat you. So if you feel like you're down here and you feel like, oh, I've got so much to do, then don't worry. As long as you're doing more today than you were yesterday, then you're on the right path and you're gonna start overtaking the people that started up here. It doesn't matter where you are, what matters is your trajectory. So that's it for me. This video didn't quite go as expected. To be honest, there was less that Jordan actually had to say specifically about the philosophy of Stoicism, but a lot of what he has to say kind of tangentially applies to Stoicism. Remember, if you've enjoyed this video, then make sure you give it a like. If you're new around here, then make sure you subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video. You should probably go ahead and watch this video right now. I'll see you there.